And I think it, it does make a difference in the culture of our state. Um, I'm excited about innovation and entrepreneurship. One of the things we did this year, Willie, is we're making it basically free to start a business. So rather than have to pay filing fees, if you're starting a new S Corp or C Corp, uh, we're waiving that. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Welcome everyone to another Walker webcast. I'm Governor Polis, it is fantastic to see you and thank you for joining me. Let me do a quick intro to you and then we'll dive into my questions for you. Um, governor Polis is the 43rd governor of the state of Colorado. He served in the US Congress before being elected governor. Uh, and prior to that had an extremely successful business career um, launching three um, high tech companies and um, doing very, very well in the private sector before he shifted his focus to the public sector. And we will talk about that in a little bit, Governor Polis. Um, Governor Polis grew up in Southern California, went to Princeton University. Um, and I have uh, been honored to become a friend of the governor's um, since my family moved to Colorado uh, several years ago. Uh, governor Polis, we are celebrating Pride Month in the United States this month. And uh, you were married to Marlon Reese and one of the only two LGBTQ governors in the country, along with Kate Brown of Oregon. Um, What's it mean to you to represent the LGBTQ community in one of the highest political offices in the country? We give Kate a hard time because she's married to a man, but that's OK. You know, the B represents, too. Um, happy Pride, everybody. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, enormous Denver Pride will be um, the, the weekend af uh, uh, after next. It's going to be enormous. Hundreds of thousands of people. We have different Pride events across our state. One of the things we really cherish about Colorado is Colorado for all. I mean, we, we celebrate everybody, no matter uh, who you are, who you love, where you're from. You know, we have people that are descendants of Native Americans who've been here for thousands of years. We have people who arrived in Colorado last week from Mexico or China or New York, and they're really all part of making Colorado an even more amazing place. But, you know, people will ultimately remember the work we do on, on the issues that matter to them, whether they're gay or straight or black or white. You know, our universal kindergarten and preschool, which we now have in Colorado, are huge benefits for parents, for kids. Uh, you know, when, when you're driving down a road and we're able to uh, reduce the traffic with our infrastructure package, you know, no matter who you are, you benefit from that. So it's really about what unites us, what brings us together. And Pride Month in particular, it's about, you know, being proud of of, of whoever you are. We all deserve to be proud and confident in who we are. And for too long, there's been too many folks who have been marginalized who haven't felt that, but they're very much part of it in Colorado. So Governor, your mother um, wrote a book called Depression and Back, as well as she um, produced a PBS documentary, The Misunderstood Epidemic Depression. How does this personal connection to depression impact your policy making as it relates to mental health? Certainly, my, my mom uh, has helped inform me of the importance of it, and, and I, of course, watched her documentary and got to hear many of the stories that were even on the cutting board that didn't make it into the final hour. But yeah, when I came in, we sort of inherited a really um, com overly complicated and inefficient behavioral health system. And what we set out for the my first days in office is, let's fix this. Let's make this person-centered. So access to behavioral health care when you need it, where you need it, rather than having to navigate government bureaucracies at the time when you least want to do that. Um, nobody wants to do that even in good times. But if you're facing mental health issues, you even less want to have to navigate bureaucracies on be on hold and talk to six people. So we set about doing that. We, we it came we're now consolidating our behavioral health approach from all the different agencies that had it into one agency and really focused on getting that as a single front door or gate to people in need so they can get connected to the help they need when they need it. Because we don't want any Coloradan to struggle alone. Help is available. And I won't quit until these services are accessible, affordable for everybody. Uh, and that's really our goal. And absolutely my mom's movie about depression and back, you know, helped inform those goals. So you created a behavioral health administration governor. It seems to make perfect sense from those of us from afar and outside of government, but my assumption is that creating a whole new administration under behavioral health was a pretty heavy lift. How, how difficult is it, if, it, if, it, if you will, to kind of recast or reshape the, 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 the bureaucracy that exists in the state of Colorado to create something like that and pull it all together? So it's hard, but it also is a lot easier to do things at the state level than nationally. And, and Willie, as you know, I was a member of Congress for 10 years, and 
it is very hard to change. Here at the state level, we move a lot faster. So we started with involving many stakeholders that we knew were reform oriented, but we wanted to speak with a voice that had input from dozens of people. Uh, we then came out with a blueprint and then we set about implementing that blueprint with the state legislature and we got it done. We got it done. Um, there were certain special interests against it, especially behavioral health. There's folks that are funded that don't have accountability built in. And part of what we're doing is we want to build an accountability. It's not just money you get from the government. You got to show us that you're actually helping people and, and document that. So that's all built in. And obviously there were some that that uh, would have preferred um, to not have that accountability and transparency. But overall, uh, getting things done at the state level is very possible. You need a deliberate plan, a thoughtful approach. Uh, and it, it took us a couple of years to get the full structure and change in place. But we, we did it and that the Behavioral Health Administration goes live July 1st. So that's when the results of the work of the last two years uh, goes live. So Governor, guns and gun policy has obviously been in the headlines recently, given the tragedy in Texas and um, gun violence is obviously something that ties back to Colorado. Um, very unfortunately, with the many of us can remember Columbine, which sort of set off this, um, if you will, past two decades of um, very, very unfortunate and tragic incidents at, at schools across the country. Mental health is 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 a component part to the issue on guns and 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 gun policy in the country. How? How have you, and I know you've done it exceedingly successfully, how do you, if you will, manage the two pressures that you're under for increased gun control in the state of Colorado and at the same time, the Second Amendment rights for people to bear arms given the sort of the populace of Colorado and the complexity of this issue and how closely and dearly it has touched the hearts of many Coloradans? We have a very uh, good law, kind of a nexus of mental health and guns. It's called the red flag law. Um, and, and I'll describe what it does, but it's actually now one that is going to be embraced, we hope, with this bipartisan group of senators, 10 Democrats, 10 Republicans. Uh, this is really um, important because there's a very high bar, as there should be, for involuntary detention of somebody in a mental health crisis. The, 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 the legal bar is immediate danger to themselves or others. Immediate danger, right? So literally, you're about to stab yourself or someone else, you can be in detention for 24, 72 hours. But then, well, guess what? You you are released. And many people who are released or who don't quite meet that bar uh, can still be dangerous. It might not be seen as an immediate danger, um, right? And so how, when a parent sees is their 19-year-old kid and they see them going through something, they're worried they're suicidal, that they're going to uh, lash out, what is the legal mechanism where they can temporarily temporarily lose access to their guns while they work on their mental health? And so that's what the red flag law does. It allows generally a parent, but it could be a brother, sister, spouse, um, to be able to temporarily remove access to guns to somebody, somebody who's having a mental health crisis. It's been used a few hundred times in Colorado since we implemented it. And uh, there's no question that some of those would have resulted in tragedies that we were able to, because of this, uh, remove uh, remove that opportunity for that person in a mental health crisis to uh, damage or kill themselves or others. So this is part of what's being embraced nationally. The, the part that's still missing in Colorado is we need to get the word out on this. Um, people in different communities don't always know about this. So how do we make sure that anybody facing this situation with a loved one is equipped with the information about how easy it is to use the red flag law and potentially save their own life or the life of their, their loved one? And having been in Washington in Congress and now being governor of a state, how much should this be a state issue and how much should this be a national issue as it relates to, obviously the second amendment is clearly a national issue, but as it relates to setting up responsible laws at the local level, do, do governors and do state legislatures have the ability to, to, to tighten some of this down like Colorado has done that can for, you know, move this further without waiting for Washington to do it? We do. Uh, where, 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 it, where it, it would benefit from national attention are things like we have in Colorado universal background check, right? But the problem is if you're a convicted felon in Colorado, you can drive an hour and a half to an open air gun show in Wyoming and you can purchase a weapon without a background check. So that is a big loophole. I do support universal background checks 
nationally. I think that would cut down on illegal guns. You know, again, some people, because they're a convicted felon, they might have lost the, the right to bear arms. They might be on probation. Those are all valid parts to the due process of law. But you need an enforcement mechanism around that. We have that in Colorado. But as long as you're only, you know, an hour and a half away for an open air gun show with no background check, it has still as useful. We should still do it. But that is a glaring loophole. Yeah. So, Governor, as I mentioned at the top, you are one of very few people who's been able to be wildly successful in, if you will, two distinct industries. Um, you were in the business world. You did extremely well there and have now come into the um, political world and have been extremely successful there, having been elected to Congress and now governor of Colorado. As you think about those two careers, what's the what's the best and the worst of the private sector and what's the best and the worst of the public sector? Well, I, I love the private sector. I was an early stage guy, Willie, entrepreneur. So uh, founding early stage, raise capital, you know, grow it usually and then less operational as they get to a few dozen people, uh, maybe in a board role. And, you know, to me, the biggest company I grew, proflowers.com, had 250 people. Uh, when we sold it. And to me, that was an enormous company, right? <laughs> I, I get amazed where people say it's under 500, it's still called a small business. So it's all relative. I've, I've never been kind of in that corporate world, but I've been in the entrepreneurial world. Um, so, uh, you know, and I, I really love the private sector and it's exciting every day and, and there's always something new. I think what the public sector gives is that additional fulfillment of knowing, okay, I'm now working really on behalf of others, trying to bring the experience that I have in life to bear to create a better outcome for everybody, whether it's improving education for, for kids, uh, whether it's you know fixing our roads, whether it's in, we're saving people money on healthcare. Uh, I wanna make sure that I'm doing everything I can to, to make that a reality. So I really enjoy both. Uh, and a, a lot of the skills have been transferable, but I do like the public mission um, of being able to work on a broad array of public policy to make life better in Colorado. Do you think that that mix of backgrounds is, I don't want to say a necessary component to success, but given that Colorado is a purple state and you're managing, I mean, if you travel, as you and I know very, very well, many people listening to this may not know that well. If you go from Colorado Springs, which is a very red city to Boulder, which is a very blue city, and you've got Denver in the middle, that kind of, you know, those three cities from Boulder down to Denver, down to Colorado Springs gives people a real sense of the melting pot that is the politics of the state of Colorado. Do you think that that background, having a business background, allows you, if you will, to identify more with what people typically would say are people on the right and then also just your general orientation as it relates to being a Democrat that allows you to be so successful in a, in a purple state like Colorado? First of all, I think it, it makes a difference that Colorado now, we've now had 12 years of having an entrepreneur as governor. John Hickenlooper, my predecessor, also an entrepreneur. And if I win re-election this November, that'll be 16 years of having an entrepreneur at the helm. I don't think any states had that before. And I think it, it does make a difference in the culture of our state. Um, I'm excited about innovation and entrepreneurship. One of the things we did this year, Willie, is we're making it uh, basically free to start a business. So rather than have to pay filing fees, if you're starting a new S Corp or C Corp, uh, we're waiving that. And that's not a lot, but it's, you know, 75, hundred bucks. But if your whole starting budget for a business is $500 and there are people that save up, you know, a year to get the $500 they need to start a business, that's a lot, right? And it's like, that's like 15, 20% of their budget that we're saving them by saying it's free to start a business. It's actually $1 to start a business for legal reasons, but still $1 instead of $100. Uh, it's essentially uh, free. And that's very exciting to people. So we want to encourage innovation, entrepreneurship. It's not about left or right. It's about, you know, what's the best way to move Colorado forward. We're a very future oriented state. <clears throat> we, we live here because we love it. We want to protect and preserve our quality of life and, and uh, really address some of the issues we, we face, like rising costs. And that's why our agenda is focused on saving people money, expanding parks and access to outdoor areas um, to make Colorado even better. Like all governors, Governor, you have a broad constituent base across the state. And at the same time, the main economic drivers of the state are in the front range cities of Boulder to Denver to Colorado Springs. And yet at the same time, the ranching community and the farming community comprise a big part of the overall of the state from a land mass standpoint, but then also economic production. How do you, how do you manage that, just like you manage blue and red issues, if you will, being a purple state, how do you manage 
staying in touch with the ranchers and the farmers in a state that is as large and dependent on that part of the economy, as well as all the technological innovation and 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 um, investment in, in in new businesses that happens on the front range. Yeah, I mean, our biggest export as a state is beef. And so we are at our heart a farming and ranching state. Uh, and we really talk about it in terms of rural urban unity. It's about both sides being stronger and better, needing one another, our suburbs, our cities, our rural areas. There is no Colorado without Yuma County and Sedgwick County. Uh, and you know, when I when I when I speak to the cattlemen and rural communities, they they love that line. But then I follow up by saying there is no Colorado without Denver and Boulder, because there truly isn't in Colorado Springs. Um, our whole state is part of that value equation. Uh, whether it's in the ag tech side where CSU is doing amazing work out of Fort Collins, it's powering the future of the ag industry, not just in Colorado, but across the world, uh, whether it's new practices in soil health uh, and uh, agrivoltaics and other areas that are the intersection between renewable energy and, and farmland, uh, new, more water efficient crops to increase yields and decrease costs for farmers. So really a lot of exciting things happening in ag. And it's a big part of our state success story. It's also one of our major climate dependent industries, the other being the skiing and outdoor recreation industry, uh, which is one of the reasons that Colorado is such a leader on climate, uh, because we're directly impacted uh, by the changing climate with two of our key industries. So when you talk about climate, um, water is obviously become a huge issue. Um, I believe that every county in the state last year hit drought level at some point during the year. Um, what are you doing? What's the state doing? What's the federal government doing to try and address this issue as it relates to water and natural resources? First of all, investing in water stewardship projects. Uh, and we, we also have to make sure talking about rural urban unity, one of the key tenants of that is that our administration, we do not support, we oppose these buy and dry efforts where farmland is dried up to feed the fast growing suburbs. That pits one Coloradan against another. We think the answer is all of us together. There's never an answer in drying up farmland. We need to make sure we're able to continue to be a top production state. At the same time, we need to make sure we implement better conservation practices in our fast growing cities and suburbs. For instance, we signed a bill that now supports turf replacement with uh, native grasses or artificial turf at, at um, where there's large grass areas and parks, et cetera. We have to think about how we can better support homeowners in doing zero scaping uh, around their homes. Uh, we've got to find a more efficient way to do this so that we can avoid pitting some Coloradans against others. And so the Colorado River flows through Colorado, but supplies a tremendous amount of water to the states of Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. For, for those who don't know, how, how, does, how do the water rights to the Colorado get determined and how much does the governor of Colorado and does the state of Colorado determine the usage of that water flow? Yeah, there is a interstate compact between the states that draw from the Colorado River. Uh, we are, of course, one of the uh, headwater states, means, uh, meaning we are uh, upstream, if you will. Uh, so we get our draw, but they are also guaranteed certain rights downriver. So it's the short answer to your question is the governor has very little say over it, unless there's a renegotiation of the compact. There's not one occurring now. We have ongoing compact basin meetings, but there's a large body of law around that and a very detailed compact about the disposition of those water rights. Now, of course, what we're worried about is with the hotter and drier climate, um, those uh, obligations will not be able to be met over time. And there's a lot of thinking in all of the basin states about how we can adapt to this new drier environment. Talking about a drier environment, forest fires. Fortunately, the summer of 2021, Colorado, for all practical purposes, you may correct me on this, Governor, but there was not, to my knowledge, a major forest fire in the state of Colorado in the summer of 2021, which is unlike 2020, where we had some very significant fires. Um, to the to the outside of government, those of us who both live in Colorado and spend a lot of time in the Mountain West, this issue of drier and more forest fire activity and smoke in the air seems to be something all of us need to get sort of accustomed to given what the trends seem to be. What are you doing and what do what do, do states like Colorado need to do to be better prepared to deal with these natural disasters that seem to be happening on a more frequent basis, particularly in states like California and some of the other Western states? So uh, we are upping our game on, on rapid response. We've acquired a new Firehawk helicopter. We've added new tankers to our leases. We also are 
supporting additional um, mitigation, meaning taking down trees and fuel uh, to defend, sort of to create perimeters around subdevelopments and also at the home level, uh, really upping our, our, our game on that. It makes an enormous difference uh, when you do this kind of mitigation. We also, in addition to the three largest wildfires in the entire history of Colorado in the summer of 2020, also experienced the most destructive fire in the history of our state uh, just six months ago, Marshall fires in Boulder County, over a thousand homes destroyed. So, um, and that was in December, right? Who would have thought such a destructive fire in the middle of winter? We had a very dry winter, no snow on the ground, and, and that's what happened. I know that your team did Herculean efforts to make it so that that fire was contained and didn't turn into even a larger um, crisis in Boulder County. And um, I, uh, I would just take my hat off to you and your team for their quick response to that. And while it was tragic and a loss of a huge number of homes in Boulder County, um, had it not been for some very amazing work by you all and the electric utility, my understanding is that it could have been a lot worse than it ended up being. Yeah, there's some great heroism from the first line responders. For the first night, the frustrating part was we had winds at 105 degree gusts. So really our fire response ground to a standstill. We cannot operate our aircraft. We cannot operate on the ground, very limited uh, with high winds. Uh, then we got, you know, drop in the winds, a little bit of precipitation. But absolutely, the evacuations went um, amazingly smoothly. We even evacuated a hospital in, in a very quick period of time. I think what you might be alluding to is we were able to save uh, the power station there that would have caused you know, immense power outages across the high country, really golden out through Eagle and Summit County, uh, had we not been able to get the Excel folks in there to, uh, to, to address that. Yeah. So going from, if you will, rural issues to more urban issues, you have a policy called Revitalizing Main Street, uh, where you've already supported more than 100 communities across the state of Colorado in revitalizing Main Streets. Um, in the aftermath of the pandemic, where most Main Streets, not most, all Main Streets were shut down, um, what are you seeing, Governor, as it relates to the revitalization of Main Streets, and, and more particularly the downtown of, of Denver, which for, you know, for quite some time now has yet to pull back in the, the, the traffic flows and the foot traffic that was there pre-pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about these investments. First of all, we also can talk about what might come out of the pandemic era that's good. I'm hoping some of the on-street dining, the additional um, opportunities to expand outside will continue. They continue at municipal discretion. The state absolutely now permanently allows it. Our piece was the allowing the delivery of wine and alcohol to a non-contiguous plot. We, we allow all that, but um, we encourage all the cities to continue a piece of that vibrant outdoor lifestyle, um, especially when the weather is good. Um, but what the Main Street investments do, this is a main, really millions of dollars around connectivity. It's around bike paths that connect downtowns to residential neighborhoods. It's about transit corridors. It's about um, bridges. It's about pedestrian crossings. It's really about making a better experience in small towns and large towns across the entire state through the built environment. Um, and a lot of towns had great ideas and we worked with them and were able to fund some of those ideas to really make transformational change, connecting communities that were historically cut off, creating pedestrian access and really revitalizing not just the commercial centers, but also really the cultural centers of, of civic life across our state. So on that, um, to, to, to make those city centers work and, and run. Um, you're also dedicated to moving Colorado's electric grid to 100% renewable by 2040. Um, this whole issue, Governor, between fossil fuels and renewable energy is one that is at the national level today, particularly given that fuel prices are over $5 a gallon. Um, as you make that transformation, what are the real, what are, first of all, how are you doing on the path to making the grid 100% renewable by 2040? And second of all, what are the, what are the big barriers to to realizing that goal? So we now have, Willie, um, really locked in with all of our utilities. We're gonna be at 80% plus in just seven and a half more years by 2030. Wow. So um, that's the, and that leaves that final decade, 2030 to 2040 to get to 100%. But whether it's Excel or, or Holy Cross or um, uh, any of the major utilities in our state, UPI and, um, Tri-State, uh, we'll be at that full 80%, probably in 2029, Willie. So, um, you know, it's probably about six, seven years. Um, and it's just a matter of we have the retirement of the high cost coal. Coal is the highest cost form of power. Let's start. People should know that from the start. 
the reason we pay more on power is because of costly coal plants. So the sooner we can phase those out and close them, the sooner that we will have a consumer dividend from low cost solar and wind energy. Uh, and then figuring out how to make sure we can have that base load uh, through storage uh, and other ways we do that. Uh, geothermal, electric, hydro in some places, not as much in Colorado, uh, is gonna give you a key part of keeping rates low and reliable and uh, cleaning our air. As you know, Governor, Bill Gates has done a bunch of work on, if you will, safe or clean uh, nuclear energy. And there's been a big call for more investment in nuclear energy. What's your take as it relates to the possibility that Colorado could actually turn to nuclear power and, and use that as a form of maybe even that extra 20% that you were talking about? Or is, is that just a bridge too far given that people still have in the back of their mind Three Mile Island? You know, it's, it's always one of those things, Willie, that seems like it's five to 10 years out in terms of commercial <laughs> viability. And it was, you know, it, 20 years ago in the year 2000. Oh, yeah. You know, by by 2008, 2010, we'll have this, you know, in 2010, they said we'd have it by 2020. And now, you know, let's say by 2030. I mean, maybe eventually they'll be right. We still don't have flying cars. And we've been waiting for those since the 1950s. They've always been 10, 20 years out. But I mean, it has to make the commercial case on viability. Uh, a lot of the technologies being developed are modular. Uh, smaller scale, more distributed. There's a lot of promising things on the drawing board. Some might even be at that kind of um, uh, investigative level, but there's been nothing deployed at scale that is yeah. anywhere close to the economics of solar or wind. And so, you know, I'm, we're all hopeful maybe in five or 10 years, we will be there. We'll see. Um, last time you joined me on this webcast, it was right in the midst of the pandemic and you were extremely generous to take some time to give our listeners an idea of how um, a governor was dealing with the many, many just sort of crisis issues that you were dealing with at that time. Um, I guess my first question to you, Governor, would be, are we are we beyond the pandemic? Well, yeah, I think we're, we're in now is we're in an endemic stage of uh, illness that's still, for instance, today, there's over 200 Coloradans hospitalized with COVID-19, about 250. To put that in perspective, that's still two to three times higher number of people hospitalized than we would have during a bad flu season from flu. But um, this is going to be the, the normal. I mean, there's more immunity out there because people have had it. People have been vaccinated. We, 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 we built that up. So even at the larger infection numbers, a much smaller percentage of people are hospitalized. But yes, yeah, some people are still hospitalized. Tragically, some people still will, will die from this, even though we have more therapeutics now. We had no zero therapeutics two years ago. We now have uh, therapeutics and treatments in addition to the preventative aspects of the vaccination. You've been credited with sort of, if you will, threading that needle very effectively between, if you will, to go to extremes, the lockdown policies of some blue states and the more, if you will, liberal, there's nothing going on policies of some red states. As you think back on it, Governor, what was the what was the guiding principle that allowed you to kind of take those two very significant political kind of inputs from both sides of the aisle? One side saying you got to lock everything down and throw away the key. The other side saying we just got to keep living with our lives and be able to find that happy medium that you so effectively found throughout the pandemic. You know, I, I, it was really about empowering people to make the best decisions for themselves. So, I mean, look, um, but, you know, wearing a mask can reduce your risk. If you want to wear it, wear it. There were some communities that required it. Um, you know, getting vaccinated, you know, it's the right thing to do. It protects yourself. Just getting that data as a trusted messenger out to really give people the information they need to weigh those trade-offs in their own mind and make informed decisions about what they want to do, right? The government is not, nor should we be in the business of telling people whether to skydive or whether to go out on motorcycles. And we're not in the business of saying, yes, there's a pandemic, but you know, if you want to go to a bar or nightclub, that's up to you. This is the risk profile. If you've been vaccinated, this is, this is what you should understand. But absolutely, we're, we're not about to say you shouldn't be able to do it. So it's about empowering people with the information, with their own personal health, uh, risks, the trade-offs in their lives to make the best decisions for themselves. So you created an office of saving people money on health care headed by Lieutenant Governor Primavera um, to try and identify and implement policies to, that will reduce health care costs in the state. Um, sounds great. Um, huge issue, particularly in an inflationary environment where health care costs have been rising at a much, much higher rate than the cost of pretty much anything else in our economy. Um, what have been the successes and what have been the challenges? 
Yeah, we're, we're focused on really saving people money and all major cost drivers. So two of the biggest for most families are housing and healthcare. Those are going to be your biggest, but we've also, and that's why we provided major property tax cuts, um, additional uh, tax incentives. Every Colorado is going to be getting a $500 tax rebate back later this summer. But on healthcare, a lot of our focus has been around people who don't get it through their job, through an employment-based policy. So people who buy it on their own, usually in the exchange. And so we, we created a reinsurance program that reduces rates by over, it has reduced rates already by over 20% for people who buy it on their own. The, the, where we need to make progress, um, in addition to the hospital and provider side is the pharma side. And so we are now working on uh, the, uh, we have the authorization to negotiate for better prescription drug rates to import prescription drugs from Canada and Mexico. The FDA needs to approve that, but we have our application in. Uh, so we're doing everything we can as a state. We need national action. You can do that. Sorry to, sorry to jump in, Governor. You can yeah. do that on a state basis to get that approval from the FDA, and they'd give it just to Colorado? Uh, there's, I think, two or three states pursuing it, Florida, Colorado, maybe Connecticut. So I think there's two or three states that are in the hopper that we're hoping we get that, that authorization to do. People can do this on their own, not insurance pay, but you legally can import for your own use, you know, from another country. But what we're trying to get it connected with is into the payer side. So then we can in larger scale uh, and, and pass those savings along in the form of reduced premiums to people. So um, it's an exciting area. It, it's it's a inefficiency in the market because these pharma companies shouldn't be charging Americans more in the first place and they're charging other wealthy industrialized nations. But it would allow a backdoor mechanism to address that, which is one reason pharma doesn't, doesn't want to allow that. But um, yeah, the importation absolutely will start saving people money right away if we can move forward with that at a larger scale. That uh, applying to the FDA for that approval, Governor, makes me think about the um, federal banking regulations as it relates to banking the cannabis industry and the fact that uh, you still can't use the backbone of the federal banking system to actually purchase or sell cannabis. Um, any, any chance that given the number of states today, including the state of Colorado that have legalized cannabis, that there's going to be a change to that federal policy? Yeah, there's there's a real movement to do that, uh, led by one of our Congress people from Colorado, Ed Perlmutter, called the Safe Banking Act, um, which would basically create that safe harbor for banks not to have to worry about doing business with uh, businesses that are following our state laws. Uh, it probably has enough support to pass. That's the first. I mean, it passed the House, by the way, overwhelmingly bipartisan vote, 300 and some votes. I mean, really strong. It probably has the 60 plus votes in the Senate. Uh, so when something's like that, you're like, geez, why don't they just do it? Put it into something. So that would be huge. It's certainly a priority of ours. I've talked to and Senator Bennett and Senator Hickenlooper are very supportive of it, but we just need to get it done because it creates, when you when you don't have access to the normal financial services sector from the cannabis side, it just increases costs. It prevents us from reading, reaching the goals of um, driving the illegal drug market out of business. And um, it just is very inefficient way to do things and dangerous, frankly, because a lot of people know there's a lot of cash moving around in that sector. You know the cannabis, the impact of the cannabis industry on the state of Colorado better than anybody. As you look back on Colorado and all of the either benefits and also fears that people had when cannabis was legalized in the state, as you look at back at what has happened subsequently as it relates to both revenues attained as well as crime, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Is it a, is it a glowing scorecard that says that it's worked across the board? Is there anywhere that the fears have actually demonstrated themselves to have been worthy of fears and, and concerns? I think it's worked well overall. Um, the, a lot of the studies show that underage use has been uh, steady or even lower in some studies among 14 to 16 year olds. So that's a good thing. Uh, it's obviously generated tax revenue that's gone to build community youth centers and build schools. Uh, I think there's been, especially now, I worry about uh, the fentanyl toxicity and poisoning. So if you have an underground market of marijuana, you're, you're, you're a lot more dangerous. We would have, I'm sure in states where it's illegal, they're going to be losing more people to fentanyl laced marijuana. We don't have that through our regulated markets. So we've kept the product safer. Uh, we've uh, reduced or at least held steady underage use. And uh, it's absolutely helped revitalize economically many communities across our state as well. So I, I would, you know, I think it's been a good thing. Many states are following suit. Most recently, our neighboring state, New Mexico, just came online. And I think Illinois is coming online. So uh, it really is moving across the country. You mentioned on health care that health care and housing are the two largest expenditures for Colorado residents. Um, in a recent Forbes ranking of the 
100 best cities in America. Two of the top five were in the great state of Colorado, Colorado Springs and Boulder. Um, everyone seemingly wants to come to your state. And at the same time, that has only driven the cost of housing up to a level where many can't afford it anymore. What are you in the state doing as it relates to housing affordability? Yeah, Colorado Springs is just doing great. Um, I mean, really great downtown revitalization and uh, great, great um, uh, quality of life. Boulder, uh, that's where I live, as you know, Willie, great, great town. Um, yeah, so so we're victims of our own success here, right? So a lot of people are worried, hey, you know, where's my 18-year-old kid going to be able to ever afford to have a down payment and own a home? Um, and so we are focused on how we can reduce costs and in housing. And so some of that, uh, we're very excited about embracing and leaning into um, some of the new prefab and modular technology, uh, homes that are made uh, and then uh, uh, largely offsite and transported. We can reduce the cost 20 to 30 percent. Land planning, uh, this is the, the, you know, the role of local governments, but what incentives can we use? to actually allow more housing to be built, supply and demand to reduce costs, uh, increase supply. You don't wanna reduce demand. We like that people wanna live here. That's a good thing, but let's increase supply. So a lot of that is happening um, and we're really trying to push for where it makes sense, development, density and transit corridors, uh, where people can live closer to where they work, shorter commute times, less pollution, less cars on the road, better quality of life. So, Governor, I want to be mindful of your time. I got a couple of final things as it relates to you personally and then your reelection uh, campaign. Um, you've always been the smartest person in the room. Uh, you graduated from high school at 16 and went to Princeton. You were top of your class at Princeton, very successful at um, launching three businesses and selling those businesses. And our mutual friend, John Delaney, when I first talked to John Delaney about you in Congress, he said, without a doubt, the smartest person I know in all of Congress. Um, when you think about that, what's the, where does your intellect come to bear in the sense, is it, you remember people's names when you walk into a room, is it that you can recall data points that allow you to kind of put an issue into context, uh, or is it that as the team sitting around trying to find a solution to something, you're there with some sort of innovative idea that sort of says, why are we looking at this way rather than that way? Well, I'd say the same about our, our friend John Delaney. By the way, he's uh, very he's brilliant as well. Just a first first rate guy, and um, uh, he would have made a very fine president. You might you might remember he ran for president. And, I do. Uh, uh, to camp out. I do. I actually. For, it's funny. Yeah. I was at a Bennett. Just as a quick aside, Governor, I was at a Bennett event in D.C. about three weeks ago, and um, I was co-hosting it with Delaney and um, I was asked to make some remarks at the beginning and I made some very quick remarks and then all of a sudden John stepped out and sounded exactly like a, a presidential candidate and then Bennett came up who also ran for president and he made his and afterwards I said when you're going in front of two guys who have both run for president of the United States make sure your comments are very very quick because no one will remember them when you have two guys like that speaking behind you but anyway um, go ahead um, but where, where does that skill yeah. where does that where do you really feel like that um, gives you a, a leg up, if you will? Yeah, I would say, first of all, as kind of a um, entrepreneur and a disruptor, it's avoiding groupthink. And, and you know, if anything, when everything has been done one way for a long time, my first thought is, well, it probably ought to be done a different way uh, rather than just keep doing it the same way. So how do you kind of introduce that needed disruption into the public sector side, reinvent and improve the efficiency of legacy systems. Um, that was very much my background as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, trying to surround yourself with creative people as well, people that share your values, you have to delegate. Uh, we have in the state of Colorado, for instance, 31,000 employees. I have a 19 member cabinet. So they do much of the, you know, Department of Natural Resources, Department of Health. And so they manage those departments. I meet regularly with them every week and uh, together as a cabinet. And then oftentimes, uh, independently with with members. So really pushing that change agenda, that uh, reform agenda, just because people have been doing things this way for you know 50 years uh, probably means we ought to change the way we do things. And so that's kind of the mindset that I bring to the public service. So you're running for re-election. What's the biggest difference between running the first time and running the second time as it relates to either infrastructure, branding? What's the, you know, give us a sense when you first put your hat in the ring the first time and kind of, if you will, putting all that together and now this time running for re-election. 
Well, you know, the first time I ran, people knew me well in my congressional district because I had represented it for about 10 years, Fort Collins, Boulder, Loveland, Broomfield. But um, I was not well known in Grand Junction or Colorado Springs or even Denver. So I was really spending a lot of time. I launched my campaign in Pueblo, all over the state, in communities. We had um, uh, over 100, you know, gatherings, house parties and, and, and meeting people one on one and hearing their concerns. This time around, um, I think people are a, a bit more familiar with me and my work, and uh, we're really centering our focus on saving people money because that's the call of the moment, right? We have a, from a jobs perspective, there's a strong economy. It's not that uh, it, we have actually more, more employed Coloradans now than we had before the pandemic. But what does that mean if you got a 4% raise at work, but your costs have gone up 8% because your rent's gone up and your groceries cost 20% more. So how do we reduce costs? And that's why we have a comprehensive package over a hundred things that we are getting done right now to save people money, ranging from you know removing the sales tax from items like diapers and feminine feminine hygiene products to a rebate that everybody's getting to cutting property taxes to uh, to tax credits to universal preschool and kindergarten free for every parent preschool starting next year saving over forty five hundred dollars. So really, this agenda is centered around how we, we all love Colorado. That's why we're here. How do we make sure that everybody can enjoy the Colorado we love in this challenging time of high inflation nationally? I know the focus right now, Governor, is on your reelection as governor of the great state of Colorado. But should President Biden not put his hat in the ring for reelection in 2024, might we see you looking at national office? Uh, no, I am very excited about this job that I'm pursuing, the best job in the world, governor of the state of Colorado. And I, I will be deeply honored to be able to do that for four years. And, and that's what I'm going to do, health, health permitting. So final two questions. One, you have two children. As you think about the future, what are the two most important issues that need to be resolved to make their future look like our future? Yeah, you know, our kids are ten and seven, um, and you know, in summer vacation right now and doing different camps. And you know, I, I think when we think about what it means to live in Colorado and lo and love our quality of life here, it's about protecting our our outdoor areas, our access, our parks. We we added two new state parks. Uh, it's about um, the world-class outdoor recreation opportunities we have, the quality of life we have, and just the opportunities to live your dream in Colorado, the opportunities with some of the world-class higher education institutions, uh, great job opportunities. Um, it's a great place to grow up, and, and we're looking forward to continuing to raise our kids here as well. And I know that that's why so many families choose Colorado. So final question. The eyes of the hockey world are about to descend upon Denver, Colorado, with the Avs being in the Stanley Cup Finals. Um, are you going to go and you want to make a prediction about whether the Avs beat the Lightning? So I, I don't know how subtle it is, Willie, but I'm wearing this is the Avs color here. This is my one maroon shirt that I have. I don't, I, I, not a color I wear very often, but uh, yeah, I'm excited. You know, first of all, Colorado, we're a huge sports town, Denver and Colorado. We got Nuggets, Broncos, Rapids, Avs, you know, uh, Rockies, um, you name it. Uh, and it is so exciting to see for the first time since 2001, uh, the Avs in the Stanley Cup. Uh, I, I, uh, I think it's going to be great. I'm going to be down in McGregor Square uh, this afternoon and uh, really excited to join so many Coloradans at festivities. And I think we'll take it. Tampa Bay, look out. We're coming for you. I think it's going to be great. I'm actually at UMass right now, Governor, about to give a talk to the coaching staff here. And this is where Kale McCarr went to college and uh, took UMass to the national finals as an NCAA hockey player before joining the Avs and becoming the star that he I think is. I think his brother's there now, if I'm not mistaken. He is. That's exactly yeah, right. He, Taylor, Taylor is here at UMass yeah. playing. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Governor, as always, great to see you. I, I look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon and greatly appreciate you spending time with me this afternoon. Thanks, Willie. Take care.